our para athletes. Today we have athletes uh, Claire Buchanan, we've got Candace Comden, Brianna Hennessy, Jessica Lewis, Jess Silver, and we've got equipment expert Paul Gabay from Resolution Fitness. Uh, our agenda today, we're going to start with an athlete panel and our athletes uh, have very kindly assembled their equipment. So they're going to do some demos for us so we get a sense of some of the equipment uh, that is used for different sports. We have Paul Gabay and Jess Silver who will be talking about fitness equipment for the adaptive athlete and really for anybody. This is accessible equipment. And we're going to talk a little bit about equipment rental and borrow programs and we will end this off with just everybody introducing themselves, sharing what's happening in their organizations. We're all about celebrating this community and getting the word out. So if you have something you want to share, that's a great time to do it so we can um, get the word out to everybody else in our communities. Okay. Uh, your hosts, uh, Jess Lewis and Jess Silver are the Paramazing Circle hosts. So Jess Lewis is on the call right now. Jess Silver will be joining us later. Uh, Jessica Lewis is a three-time wheelchair track Paralympian. And she's also a motivational speaker. Jess Silver is an adaptive fitness coach and she's also the founder of Flex for Access. You can catch um, some of her books on uh, Amazon as well because she's also a published author. I am Tina Finelli, one of the co-hosts and co-founders of See What She Can Do. We also have Caroline Wiley and Mark Wiley on the line who are also um, leaders in uh, at See What She Can Do. There's Candace, Claire, and Brianna. So Claire is here in person. She's live here with us today at Team Canada's Para Ice Hockey Team. Uh, Candace Comden has kindly submitted um, a whole bunch of videos so she can showcase her equipment via video. And Brianna has supplied us with some photography that we'll be able to have a look at. So thanks to all the generous athletes who are participating. And uh, we're gonna jump into our athlete panel. We'll kick it off with some equipment demos. Why don't we start with Jess Lewis? So actually all the, um, for Jess and Candace who are both on the call, um, we're gonna start with Jess Lewis. If you can tell us a little bit about how you got involved in your sport and the type of equipment you use to participate, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so I got involved in uh, wheelchair track racing um, in 2006. Um, I was part of an organization here in Bermuda called Windreach Bermuda. Um, there is a Windreach in Canada as well. Um, and this is just an organization that provides um, different programs for people with disabilities. Um, and they hosted a um, adaptive sport expo um, where they brought down athletes and coaches from Canada and the States um, just to showcase, you know, what was available in the world of para sport. Um, and uh, Ken Tom, uh, as well as his son, Curtis Tom, uh, came down um, to showcase wheelchair track racing um, and offered to coach me when I was interested in it. Um, so I started uh, training with him in uh, 2011. Um, and unfortunately, we did lose Ken in 2017. Um, he did pass away. Um, and now I'm being coached by Curtis Tom, his son. Um, so that's kind of how I got my start. <laughs> and that's your Canadian connection as well. It is. Because yeah. Jess right now is sitting in beautiful, sunny Bermuda <laughs> while we are in the very frigid cold of Canada, um, but that's your connection with Canada, right? Your coaches. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Um, do you know what, before we jump over to, to uh, Claire, why don't you tell us a little bit about your equipment? We have the phone, your photos up here now, and you've got equipment sitting behind you. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about your equipment? Yeah. Um, so I have um, my racing chair here behind me. Um, so the racing chair is a lot different than um, what the day chair is. Uh, the main difference being that it has three wheels. So there's two wheels in the back and one at the front. Um, and the back wheels are um, slanted a bit. Um, so we call that a camber. Um, and that's used um, to help keep uh, the athlete stable in the racing chair uh, when going around the track um, because we do hit a lot of higher speeds. Um, so there are um, different types of chairs that you can get. Uh, the chair that I have that um, most people uh, use is called a kneeling chair. So I actually am uh, kneeling in it, my legs go underneath me. Um, but if the athlete isn't able to get into that position, um, they can also have a foot plate um, put in kind of underneath the frame um, that their feet can sit in. 
Um, there's also a lot of different types of wheels that uh, can't be put onto a racing chair. Uh, so the wheels that I have are uh, made out of carbon fiber um, and they are a quad spoke, so four spokes. Um, and this is uh, a type of wheel that's kind of used more for the advanced athlete. Um, for beginner athletes, they will use um, a, bike, uh, a wheel that has um, a lot of spokes, kind of like a bicycle tire. Um, and that just kind of um, gives a little bit more protection on the hands um, when using the chair. Um, the racing chairs are all uh, made to fit the athlete like a glove, um, just because you kind of have to be one with the chair when you're when you're moving. Um, and there is different um, seats or buckets that um, can be used as well. So a lot of the beginner athletes will use a seat that has upholstery seating that can be adjusted using Velcro. Um, and this is just used so that um, you can find, you know, what is the most comfortable position as well as the most um, effective position um, based on the athlete's body type. Um, my chair that I have now, I did start with an upholstery seat, um, but the seat that I have now is called a hard panel. Um, so it's basically the whole um, bucket is made out of aluminum. Um, and this is, um, I'm not allowed to um, change my position. So I'm pretty confident in where I'm sitting in my chair. Um, and this also allows um, for uh, more stability in the athlete. So with upholstery seating, when you're pushing the chair, um, the athlete's body can move a little bit. Whereas in the hard panel, um, when the athlete pushes, they stay solid in their frame. Um, there is also um, a big difference in the way that these chairs are pushed. Um, so in our day chairs, um, we will just grab the wheels and push like this. Whereas in the racing chair, we'll use um, different gloves. So. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the different styles of gloves that there are. So the first uh, style of glove that I used was called a soft glove. And it's basically a whole mitt and it's made out of rubber. Um, and this provides a really big push surface um, for the athlete to use. So that's why a lot of um, new athletes coming into the sport will use this style um, as you're learning the push technique. Um, and now I've transitioned into using a hard glove, which is a lot uh, smaller of a surface. Um, and this is actually made from a 3D printer, which is pretty cool. Um, and the main difference with the hard gloves is um, obviously the smaller surface, as well as it allows you to generate a little bit more power into the push um, and really helps you to maintain a higher speed. Um, so. Uh, I thought I would get in my chair just to show you the push a little bit easier and trying to explain it. So you can see that it's very tight in here because I have to kind of Twist a little bit to get in first. And then my chair is sitting on um, a roller, which is a, another piece of equipment that we use. Um, oh, sorry. Mainly in the uh, winter months in Canada when we can't get outside on the track. So the roller basically makes the racing chair into like a stationary bike idea um, so that you're able to train indoors. I have a lot of um, different straps that help to just secure me into the chair. And that's because of my uh, disability classification, which is something that we're gonna be talking about a little bit later. So as you can see, my legs are underneath me down here, kneeling over. So for the push, we actually don't grab the push rims. We just use the glove or yeah, the glove and we punch it on the push rim. So then we go around. And when you, when you first start um, in a race, we only use um, 
uh, portion of the push rim just to get the wheels moving quick. And then we transition into our long stroke, which is more powerful. Jess, that is amazing. How fast can you, how fast can you move? Like, what's your um, quickest speed roll, you've picked up? <laughs> on a roller, um, the best that I've hit is um, 35 kilometers. Um, and on a track, my best is, um, I think, 32 kilometers. So we are amazing. moving pretty quick. <laughs> That's amazing. And then on the racing chair, I forgot about the steering. There is different types of steering. Um, so the top here, um, which I can use here, is mainly for road races um, that we would use this steering. Um, and then for track races, we have what's called a compensator, which is underneath the frame here. And it's um, basically a triangle. And when you're going around the track, I'll hit one side of the compensator and it moves my front wheel just enough that it can take me around the turn. And then when you come out of the turn, you hit the other side to get the chair to track straight. Um, so you're actually only off the rim for a matter of a second. Uh, what can change it yet? They also have screws on the compensator um, so that you can adjust how much it turns um, because lane one is a lot tighter of a turn than lane eight. Um, so that's, yeah, my equipment. Amazing. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That is really cool. Are there any questions people have around uh, Jess's equipment before we move on? Caroline? I, I have a quick question. I'm just curious. I, it's amazing to think that that hard glove is made by a uh, 3D printer. W yes. When was that determined? That like when did they introduce the hard glove, Jess? Um, so I think the hard glove's been around for a very long time. Um, they used to um, just have it that you would make your own hard glove um, out of plastic. Um, yep. And then um, a lot uh, more athletes um, have actually developed um, different ways to build them. Um, so the 3D printer, it was actually developed by an athlete um, in the U.S. And um, as part of a university project, they had to build something with using a 3D printer. Mm -hmm. um, and she's like, I wonder if I could do a racing glove. And uh, when that worked out and it, it did well, um, she started selling them, so. Amazing, cool. that's great. The, I just have another quick question if I may ask real quick, yeah. Tina. Um, are, are there company, specific companies, and maybe we can talk more about this at the end. Um, love to know sort of the, the key companies that do sell equipment that all of you would recommend um, to other athletes. Because, uh, you know, a lot of times it's about knowing where to go and who to go to. So just a that's thought a, for everybody. Is that's a, yeah, that's a great question. If people want to put those into the chat bar um, yeah. and then we can uh, we can share those out on the, uh, the blog post. That'd be great. So any places where you have picked up equipment or rented equipment or bought it, uh, whether it's accessories or the actual, you know, chairs or whatever other equipment you're using, that'd be great. Perfect. Yeah, they, OK. We're going to jump over to to Claire. Um, so Claire, over to you. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got into your sport? I know this is uh, where well, you play many sports. Uh, maybe talk to us <laughs> yes. a little bit about uh, this one and and uh, your experience with with basketball a little bit, and um, and then you'll showcase some of your your uh, pair ice hockey equipment for us. Of course. Yeah, I my mom actually I owe it to her getting me into all those sports that I tried. She. I was one of those kids that played all the sports, so, but I, I started off with hockey. She introduced me to hockey and, uh, here in Mississauga, um, there's a, a great organization that, um, that has multiple sports and that's, that's through that organization, the cruisers that I was able to try out pretty much any sport that I wanted to, to get my hands on. So I, I started off with sledge hockey and, and ended up also playing wheelchair basketball, which uh, led me to a athletic scholarship in the States where I won two national championships with the University of Alabama. And then during that time when I was in the States, I little did I know that there was a women's national team prepare hockey slowly forming. And so it was, it was only a couple of weeks after I moved back that I was at a basketball tournament and I, one of my teammates also pl was playing with the women's national team at the time. And uh, her parents were actually the coaches at the time. And 
she said, I, I, I remember you used to play hockey. Like, you used to be really good at hockey. Like, we have a women's team. You should try out. And I bought a sled n that next week, and I, I was on, I've been on the national team ever since. So this, this is my seventh season. Um, with the national program, we haven't had a selected national team for two years now because of the pandemic. Um, so we've we've kind of been labeled the high performance program. We don't want to single anyone out or or anything like that. So we, it's it's right now we have a high performance program, but luckily our season is back and running, and we'll be back uh, all together at the end of uh, this month. So um, finally back together. It'll be close to 700 days, but we made it. Um, amazing! <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> This is what I skate in. It's called a sled. And on the bottom, there's two blades. And when you start off in the sport, you'll start off usually having the blades anywhere from four to six inches apart to get away from that falling over and being on the ice on your side the whole time so you can get a feel for it. Um, and then kind of the, the more agile you get and the better you get, the, uh, the blades get in closer to help you turn more and it's easier to turn with the blades closer together as well. Um, there's a few different kinds of sleds uh, that you can get. Mine is fully custom, um, just like Jessica's chair. It, it's, it's made to fit like a glove, so it's, it's custom to me. Uh, you go to, there's, there's only actually one um, provider of sleds and sled equipment right now, and it's Unique Inventions in Peterborough. And I don't know how they do it, but they provide all of the equipment, all the sleds for every, every Paralympic athlete and, and every sledge hockey athlete. It's, um, I don't know how, to, how they pump out that many sleds, but <laughs> it's nonstop. Um, uh, so it's it's custom to the point where uh, the only part that I'd be able to take off for travel and stuff would be the nose of my sled. Um, and that's how we do travel with our sleds to kind of get away from um, uh, just baggage fees and stuff. It fits, fits good in my hockey bag in two pieces. Um, but with kind of when you start off in sledge hockey, you'll be able to adjust uh, how high you are, um, both at the back. Uh, and the front of the sled. So you can kind of work with your disability and work with how your body is and, and how you, where you want your kind of weight shifting. And on the front of the sled, there's what's this called is um, a bumper and it helps you. It's not supposed to touch the ice when you're in your sled, but it helps you from rocking too much as you're, as you're uh, skating. So it kind of keeps you balanced um, so, so you're not kind of rocking all over the place. Um, to be able to fit in and, and stay, stay secure, we have two, two click straps here that uh, mine are cross body. Um, everyone, everyone has their own preference with straps. Um, uh, some people strap in their feet. I just take mine and uh, we wear every single piece of equipment that stand-up hockey players wear except for hockey pants and that is because we have a protective piece that'll go over over our body into the sled so that prevents any sticking and picks getting in there so um but yeah there's uh, a few different kind of buckets as well uh, the cool thing about uh, Unique Invention is in Peterborough is that if you if you end up going in person, they'll actually like mold a sled to you. Um, so it's it's it literally fits like a glove. There's um, amputee uh, athletes usually usually benefit from that so that they're really secure in, so they don't they don't have that those straps to to keep you in tight with your legs and stuff. So. You'll find that um, single leg or double leg, double leg amps will have uh, an enclosed, fully enclosed bucket as well to kind of keep you not only protected, but more uh, like fit like a glove feel. Um, 
the and, and uh, Claire, can I ask you, does the length of your chair or sort of the length of your sled, um, does that affect how fast you go or your speed or anything? Or is there, like I know with snowboarding, the, the longer the, you know, the yeah, board or... Um, it doesn't, it is a preference. It's also preference. Uh, some people like to have their legs bent a little bit uh, for comfort um, and better mobility. Um, some, some athletes uh, don't have their lower core, so they'll kind of, They'll have their legs in a little bit more just to get that center of gravity better. Um, but honestly, it, even if you talk to the most uh, veterans, on, highest veterans on 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 the team, is that we're always tweaking our equipment, like seeing if this feels better. And uh, yeah, so it's 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 always a preference uh, when it comes to sleds. There's so many different types of sleds and and what you can do to them. So. Um, yeah, it's it's all about how it feels to you. You want to be comfortable and, and feel feel comfortable on the ice. So, yeah, awesome. The sled sticks are very different from stand up sticks. They um, we do use. Uh, you can buy. They come in two pieces. So if you find say stand up broken hockey sticks, those are like a gold mine to sledge hockey players because. That saves us a ton of money. Um, but you can also buy them in one pieces, one pieces as well. Um, they are a little bit stronger that way, but um, yeah, you can buy them separate and kind of have your own spares. And I, I have four sets of sticks, so um, the more the better. And the difference about the stand-up stick and the sled stick is, is how flat it is. When you see stand-up sticks, you'll see it, and it's a sharp angle, and there's a nice like curve on it. Sled sticks, because we're so low to the ground, and we want to be able to use the whole blade to stick handle and shoot, it's, it's more of a flat line stick. Um, the Frontier, Frontier and Warrior are the two manufacturers of sled sticks, uh, and they, they have a little bit of differences between each other. Um, the Warriors are a little bigger in width and the Frontiers are a little longer and thinner. Um, some, some use uh, different sticks for different situations. I, I know some people that'll have sticks specifically for the power play or the penalty kill or, or stuff like that. So there's some people get very, very, very specific with their, with their equipment. Um, what I found that I like is that I have really small hands, so I can actually grip the frontier better. Um, so yeah, again, it's another piece of equipment that uh, it's all your preference and and how how it makes you feel better on the ice. So Claire, um, Angela had a question around sticks for or equipment for kids, uh, uh, sleds for kids. Angela, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Hi, Claire. Hi. Um, my my son is eight, and we just got a sled um, from the children's center to trial to see if he likes it. Um, he really did like it. We've only been out once, but he was like, "That was pretty awesome." Because <laughs> um, we actually we live in Peterborough, and we have the canal in our backyard, so we're out there every weekend skating, and um, it's been pretty fun. We got two of them so that him and his cousins can actually like, and his sister can all try out the sleds. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering if you know, like, if you, we get a, if we get a custom sled for him, can he grow with it for a bit? Or would we have to have a new one made all like, do you know how, I mean, yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. So younger kids or people who start off uh, will essentially start off in an adjustable sled and that um, will be able to grow lengthwise and height-wise. Um, the only thing that you might need to replace before the actual frame of the sled would be the bucket. If, like, if he grew, if he's growing this way and this way, like, the sled is adjustable uh, lengthwise and height-wise, but you'd only essentially have to replace the bucket. And then later on, um, once he's reached his, like, kind of, max growth and 
you can kind of play around with like how he really likes to sit and, and feel in it. Cool, awesome, thank you. Yeah. That's good to know. Awesome. Claire, is there anything else you want to, uh, you want to describe about your equipment? Um, I think that's it. It's pretty, it's pretty simple of equipment. Um, it's, uh, I, I have not just multiple pairs of, um, sticks, but I also have multiple sets of blades. I, the last, the pandemic, especially I, with hockey arenas closed, I, I really took advantage of the outdoor ice uh, outside. So I do have a set of blades for outdoor ice and, and indoor ice because it, it, it will chew up your blades a lot worse than like your nice, smooth hockey ice <laughs> inside. Amazing. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing. So we've got uh, Candice here. She'll talk a little bit about her equipment um, for wheelchair tennis. She plays for Team Ontario. Here you go. The other thing that you'll notice is the two small wheels up front, and then as well as the two small wheels at the back. Um, so for some sport chairs, you'll actually see one wheel in back. Um, I believe this is down to personal choice. Um, it's to make sure that, you know, specifically in tennis, when I'm leaning back and serving, I'm not falling over backwards. Or leaning back to get a ball, I'm not falling over backwards. Um, that's not to say it doesn't happen, sometimes it does, um, but that's to sort of prevent that from happening. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice is on the foot plate, um, there is a strap to hold my foot in place. Um, this makes it easier for me to push off my left foot when I am trying to get quickly to a ball. Um, and then you'll also notice that there is a strap that goes just above my knees, basically, on the bottoms of my thighs. Again, this is to keep me in the chair, make sure that I'm not falling out if I'm reaching for a ball, um, and just to make sure that the chair actually moves with me as I'm moving around the court. Um, the other thing that you'll notice is the ratchet strap, which goes across my midsection. Um, again, this is just to ensure that I'm staying one with the chair, um, that it's going to move with me as I'm moving and go where I need it to go um, as quickly as I need it to go. Um, other than that, it's basically your typical sport chair. Um, I've got a little bag on the back here to hold tennis balls when I'm in practice. Um, but yeah, it is lightweight, so it moves quickly. Um, I'm able to lift it easily on my own uh, to get it to the club and wherever I need to go with it. Um, another fun fact about the sport chairs is that they don't generally come with bricks, um, which makes it kind of fun to get in and out of on your own. But, um, you know, thankfully I managed to do that quite well. Um, here's Candace is going to talk to us a little bit about her day chair versus her sports chair. Hi guys, me again. I'm um, just here to kind of explain to you guys the difference between my day chair, uh, which I use every day to go to work, to run errands, to do things around the house, um, and my sport chair, which I explained to you guys already, some of the fun things that come along with the sport chair. Uh, so the big thing you're gonna notice on the day chair, I'm gonna move out of the frame here, is that the wheels, the big wheels are not cam are not cambered, uh, so they're not tilted. Um, this is just because there's no need for us to go um, super fast or to make quick turns in, in the day chair. Um, it's just not something that is necessary um, every day. Um, the other thing that you'll notice is that the wheels on the front, the two smaller wheels, are a little bit bigger than the one in the sport chair. Um, and this is just to give me a little bit better grip on different surfaces, whether it be gravel or sand or asphalt or whatever. Um, another big difference you're going to notice is the fact that this chair comes with brakes. Um, I mentioned earlier that the sport chairs don't have brakes and how kind of challenging that can be to get in and out. Um, so the day chairs, it's nice. You've got the nice brakes that will make it easy to get in and out and you're not worried about falling or anything like that. Um, there we go. Um, another big difference you're going to notice is that there's no small wheel in the back of this, of the day chair. Um, again, I'm not leaning backwards. Um, that being said, I have fallen over backwards in my day chair, which is not fun. I don't recommend it. Um, maybe I should look into getting a wheel on the back. Um, day chairs do generally come with tip bars on them, um, which allow you to not tip over backwards. I, of course, have removed those. 
Um, for me, it just makes it easier to get up and down curbs easily outside um, on my own rather than, rather than have somebody else there to help tip me up. Um, another thing you're going to notice on the day chair is the fact that it has handles. Um, you know, these come in handy when I am going up a big hill or going down a big hill. Um, and I've got someone with me who's able to hold on to the handles and make sure that I'm not going too fast or that I'm not falling down backwards uh, down a big hill. Um, nice thing about these ones is that they actually, I don't know if you can see that, but it collapses in. So if I'm not with somebody or if I don't need them, then they just can go in easily. Um, the day chair as well has a nice fancy memory foam cushion on it. <laughs> Um, again, this is because I'm in it all the time. Um, I'm always using it. Um, so obviously to prevent sores and things like that, we want to make sure that we've got a nice comfortable cushion there. Um, the back is also nice and comfortable. It's molded onto my back to make sure that I'm comfortable again. Um, making sure that I'm not getting sores or that my back's not getting too sore from being in the chair all the time. Um, what else can I say about this chair? It does not glow in the dark, which is slightly disappointing, I know. Um, <laughs> I did put a fancy cup holder on this one though, so you can see that, uh, just from the dollar store. Um, other than that, um, I believe that is it as far as the differences go with the day chair and the sport chair. Um, this one is relatively light, again, not as light as the sport chair is, um, just because uh, it doesn't really need to be, um, but yeah, um, there is no strap on the foot plate. Um, again, because I don't need it, I'm not, you know, pushing off the wheelchair. I'm not trying to, you know, um, reach out a bit or anything like that. Um, for that same reason, I don't have a seatbelt. I opted for no seatbelt on this one. Um, again, just specifically for my own needs because I didn't want it. Um, I knew that I wasn't going to use it very often. Um, you know, that being said, and how many times I've fallen out of my chair, <laughs> maybe I should invest in, in it, but um, I don't have it on this one. Um, yeah, that's basically the main difference between the two of them. Um, yeah, no, I think that's it. Thanks, guys. Hi, guys, me again. Uh, I'm just here to... Great, thanks. And I will make sure that we get this presentation posted. So if the other conversation with um, Candace was echoey, you can have a closer listen, okay? Um, this is Brianna Hennessy. Jess, do you, Jess Lewis, do you wanna talk a little bit about Brianna? Sure. Um, yeah, so Brianna, unfortunately, couldn't be here with us in person. Um, she is in Florida at a training camp, as well as I think in Tampa, she has a, a um, wheelchair rugby match um, today, actually. So we're really excited for her. Um, so Brianna is a first time uh, Paralympian in para canoe and para kayak at the Tokyo 2020 Games. Um, she qualified for both sports in just a year, which is absolutely amazing. Um, she was the first woman in Canada to ever compete in para canoe at the Paralympics. And she is the only female in Canada to be imported on a U.S. wheelchair rugby team um, for the Tampa Bay Generals. Um, and currently that team is ranked fourth in the entire U.S. out of 44 teams. Um, she also has a honors uh, degree, science uh, bachelor's degree in kinesiology. Um, so these are the different equipment that um, Brianna would use um, in her sports. Um, I put her Instagram um, handle there so that you guys can follow her and learn a little bit more about um, her equipment as I don't know too much about it. Um, but she is definitely an awesome um, advocate and, and athlete. Um, so yeah. She posts awesome. on Instagram guys and she's very fun to engage with. So I recommend that you give her a follow. If you have any questions around her equipment, you can reach out to her directly. She's great at responding. Plus she's pretty kick-ass to watch uh, uh, play rugby. If you've ever seen someone like a bull in a china shop, holy smoke, she just like motors right here. <laughs> It's an incredible sport. Yeah, it's amazing to watch. Um, okay, awesome. So now we're going to jump into the classification section of um, our panel. 
Um, just do you want just Lewis? Do you want to uh, to start by talking to us a little bit about the classifications in your sport and how this impacts? Uh, equipment needs, and before we jump there, Erin uh, has raised her hand. So let's uh, let's uh, let Erin uh, ask her a question first. Go ahead, Erin. Thanks. Just quickly before we move on, I'm just wondering from all those that just presented, um, if you have suggestion, like if we're looking at purchasing equipment that can be used by multiple people, so for triad sessions in our community. Um, what are some things that we should consider uh, in terms of sizing to be able to make the experience as positive as possible? So like, obviously we can't purchase one for every sort of every size. Do you have some recommendations of things that we should consider um, in select, like say we brought in two sledges, a couple of tennis chairs, a couple of basketball chairs, rugby chairs, um, knowing that there could be a wide variety of individuals that are going to test them out. So from a safety factor, um, but also optimize the experience they're having. Um, I'll touch on the sleds. Uh, I have found, I, I do with uh, Parasport Ontario and the sled hockey experience, that is something that we do. We bring large groups out and get them in sleds. And I, I have found even with uh, adolescents to adults that the average like width size of the bucket uh, is anywhere from 14 to 17 inches. Um, and then with the uh, click straps and everything that just makes it even more adjustable and like can make it even more tight or looser and gives that kind of flexibility. And then again, with the sleds, I would go with, um, uh, the most adjustable type of sled. Um, I think it's called a razor. Yeah, it's called a razor sled. And you can adjust pretty much every piece of the sled of the frame is adjustable. So, um, and I, I, I would highly recommend starting the blades at least four inches apart. That's another part of the razor that is adjustable though. Like at the bottom of the sled, there's, ver there's like centimeter options of of being able to either bring the blades out or, or back in. And Claire, um, I seem to recall when I tried um, pair ice hockey that the bucket wasn't quite as molded as yours. It was kind of an open seat. So yeah, exactly. different yeah. size rumps can fit into it. Like <laughs> you yeah, got one like nine, you got a little one. kind of your most basic actual bucket where yes, mine is has specific places for my legs to sit. Yeah. 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 Um, Jess Silver, do you want to weigh in? Yeah. So I was just going to say that, Aaron, I would recommend that you reach out to Jeff Thiessen of Parasport Ontario if you have a question related to sledges and renting equipment or getting equipment in terms of the specific sports equipment. And then the other comment I was going to make from my own experience, um, my own training experience and also um, having a disability and also working with clients is that with chairs, you want to be mindful of the fact that uh, you won't be able to, of course, get a chair that's going to suit everybody's needs because everybody's needs are individualized. Um, so what I would suggest is that, you know, you have a few chairs that are more of a pediatric um, size. In my case, for example, I'm an adult, but I, I'm very short in stature, um, short but mighty, I might add. Um, but I need a I need a pediatric size, like a size that's in the middle of pediatric and adult. Um, but the one thing you want to also um, understand is that you can also use things like yoga blocks, for example, that you want to put behind the person's back or even like an obus form cushion to support them in a chair that they're using to play a sport. It doesn't necessarily have to be complex custom seating, but in terms of custom needs, you always have to look at the custom needs of the individual, but you might be able to use things like uh, the yoga block and again, cushions to support them in the back, as well as also um, when playing sports. Um, I know that a important feature in a manual chair and in a sports chair is um, the closed guards, like the guards that you have or the wheel guards, some of them, sometimes they're called closed guards or wheel guards. Those also help support one's hips when they're sitting in a chair. 
So that might be something to um, consider. And I could talk to you more about that as well. You're on mute, Tina. I was just heading over to Jess Lewis. You already unmuted yourself. So go ahead, Jess. Awesome. Um, so for the racing chair, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult just because um, uh, like the sizing. Um, but I would suggest is uh, making sure that they are the upholstery seating um, when you do get it. So it, it might just be that you need to have a range of sizes. Uh, and so maybe a little bit smaller and then a little bit uh, bigger of a bucket. Um, but the upholstery seating definitely will help um, with adjusting um, the position um, that the athlete can sit in. Um, in that sense, um, there is also a lot of different styles of or sizes of push rim, which is what we use to uh, move with the chair. Um, so I would suggest, um, you know, wheels that have because um, you can you can get wheels separate from the frame. Um, so I would suggest having maybe um, different uh, wheels with different sizes of push rims. Um, and also for uh, athletes just starting out, um, I, I would suggest the wheels that have um, the spokes all the way around, um, just because they are um, a little bit more forgiving with the push. So the athlete's hands don't actually go through it. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Thanks, Jess. And Aaron, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, adaptive or accessible fitness equipment shortly as well. Oh, so, okay. And I think uh, Emily, Emily Blackborough, did you just join the call? I saw Emily B come on board. I just did. Yeah. Hi, Emily. We're talking about equipment and Aaron had a question around um, bringing equipment in uh, to the town. And if there was any considerations, uh, Jess Silver suggested that she reach out to Jeff um, from Parasport Ontario. But is there anything you wanted to add in around equipment considerations when people are considering bringing some in for um, the community to try sports? Um, I've. Again, I would recommend reaching out to Jeff directly because he is kind of in charge of the equipment that we have on hand to bring um, four people to try out. I know currently that we do have a set of wheelchair, sport wheelchairs for wheelchair basketball. We have a hand cycle. We got Nordic six skis as well. Um, so quite the variety and it just it depends on when you reach out to Jeff and we have that on hand and the transportation, we would work out together in that process. So, okay. So there's the option for borrowing, but also if Aaron wanted some opinions around purchasing, she can talk to him as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Great. Uh, I'm also here too from uh, Parisport, Ontario. I just, I just did all the work with the Niagara sledge hockey league um, about the sledge question in particular. We just um, bought 36 new sleds. Uh, and we bought eight of them at 12 inches, eight and 13 inches, eight at 14 and a half inches and eight at 16 inches. That gave us the most, most variety as possible. It ended up working out for the group we got with those si sizes. We probably got lucky, but a as generic as possible, I would go with the sizes. It's, it's kind of like fitting clothing. You know, if you bought a big clothing order, you'd, you'd have a variety of small through extra large. So that's my best suggestion. And I do know that we have sledges left in the office all in those various sizes so definitely reach out that's amazing kevin can you do me a favor and maybe just put some of those sizes into the chat and then that way if aaron wants to refer to them or anybody else yeah absolutely um, and okay. uh, on that's claire's awesome. point as well we bought all um rev force ones actually not the razors oh cool. perfect thanks um and the and uh, your blades where do you get them sharpened just at a regular um Blade sharpening place or? I've been going to the same place um, since I've been living in Brampton, uh, growing up in Brampton, sorry. So I, I've kind of stuck to one guy kind of the whole time, but um, if you call around that you'll get, you'll, you will get a good mix of like, oh, we've never really had sleds come in here or they'll, they'll, they'll have quite the experience. So it's a, it's a matter of uh, going, re reaching out and seeing, seeing what's out there. Yeah, if, if I was to expand on that just quickly, sorry. Um, she She's absolutely right. And uh, from my experience, the only difference is like stand up skates, they're still on the skate and they sharpen them that way. So you just have to check with uh, your skate sharpener that they have a blade holder because obviously they can't hold them with their hands. So that's just the only difference. If they have something that can hold the blade. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin.
That's awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Jess Silver? Another very quick point I was going to make, sorry, it'll be quick, I promise, is that um, you want to also, uh, for anybody who's starting out in a sport or even doing uh, weight training like it, from the fitness side, um, something that I found from my experience in working with athletes too is that you want to have the foot plate on the chair be a fo fixed foot plate um, because for me, for example, I push a lot with my feet. Um, something that Candace said Candace said that resonated with me in her video was she uses an in her sports chair she pushes off with one foot I do that all the time when I weight train and the heavier weight that you push or pull the more you're pushing through your feet so when you're getting a chair just uh, be mindful of the fact that you want to get the one foot plate and you want to have it solid because if it's not solid it will break um, with our specificity and strength that we have Awesome. Thanks for your input, Jess. Um, okay, we're going to jump into classifications by sport um, and how it impacts uh, equipment needs. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you, Jess Lewis, if you want to talk a little bit about track. Yeah, sure. Um, I won't get into all of this because there is a lot of um, classes um, in para-athletics. Um, so I think um, pretty much every para-sport, or at least most of them, have um, what's called a classification system. And it basically um, puts athletes into different categories based on what their disability is and how that impacts um, their movement um, or maybe even just like the um, muscle capacity that they do have. Um, so for me, I'll just talk about the class that I'm in. Um, I am in what is known as the T53. So TE stands for track. Um, and then the classes 51 to 54 are athletes that have um, an impairment in their lower body. Um, and the 51, 52 are athletes that have um, an impairment to all four limbs. Um, so for 53, it basically means um, that I have no use of uh, my legs, um, as well as not a lot of um, core muscle or control. Um, so whereas a 54, um, athlete, which is the class above, would have full um, or a lot more um, trunk control. I always say the main difference with the 53 and 54 is a person that's a 53 cannot do a sit up by themselves, where somebody who's a 54 can. Um, and the different classes that you're in definitely impacts the equipment um, that's used. Uh, so for me being in a 53, I probably have a lot more straps in my chair just to help keep, keep me a little bit more secure, um, as well as um, just to help, um, since I don't have that core strength. Um, and these classes are uh, put into place so that you are competing against people of your uh, similar ability level. Um, so these are all the classes for track. Um, the running and jumping are um, for athletes that are able to run or use a prosthetic um, for their event or um, the uh, long jump as well, or high jump. Um, and then you also have here the classifications for um, athletes that compete in the field events. Um, and I've put the uh, website so you can guy can use that and learn a little bit more. Okay, Claire, over to you. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, pair ice hockey classification and well, it looks like there isn't much of, of, <laughs> of one. But you want to very short and sweet. Um, there is, yes, there's a classification process that you go through and you get classified. It's to the point of you're classifiable enough to play para hockey or you're not. Um, there isn't um, different levels of classification. Um, it's, it's strictly making sure that you have a, a level of disability to the point of being able to play the sport. Um, and Claire, I think you mentioned when we were talking offline um, that anybody can play the sport, even if there is no impairment up until the provincial or, or national levels. What? Yeah, exactly. So um, it, like for, for example, having a little kid and, and, and having the ability to have their siblings play with them or practice with them is, is something that I love about the sport is that the entire family can play hockey together and, and compete compete in a league. Um, 
Yeah, and that's that's through and through with the states and, and all over the world, I believe, that up until uh, your provincial or national team level, anyone can play the sport. So it's it's a very accessible sport to have. And um, it's, it yeah, anyone can play, no matter, no matter what. Kevin, did you want to talk about the Niagara Sledge Hockey League? I, I I let Kevin touch on that, yeah. Kevin, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. It's not much of an expansion of what I was saying, but but we we did go the route of playing with them without disabilities so that what Claire was saying, that that brothers and sons and parents, they, they could all play together. And um, uh, before the Niagara Sledge Hockey League, I did a league in Nova Scotia from where I'm from, and and we did the same thing. We found that those with disabilities tended to play longer when they had, you know, a family member or a friend from school come join them in a different aspect that they didn't have before. So that was kind of the motive there. And, you know, uh, it's great that you say that, Kevin, because Caroline and I both tried the sport because it was intermingled within a tournament. Like there was, we were having a, an ice hockey tournament and they had sledge hockey in between try it sessions. So people who have an interest in hockey um, you know, it was it was a perfect correlation. We just jumped on the ice and, you know, it was really fantastic. They had people showing us how to play and all the players were so gracious and welcoming, even though we were falling all over the place. <laughs> um, so that's fantastic. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Okay, we're going to jump into uh, wheelchair tennis classification and I'm going to mute myself so that you don't hear me and, uh, and Candace at the same time. Here we go. Okay, so I just wanted to touch a little bit on the uh, different classifications or um, divisions within wheelchair tennis. Um, you know, generally there is um, the open women's and men's divisions. Uh, so women competing against women, men competing against men, um, juniors, of course. And then there is also a quad division. Um, so that is for anybody who has um, limited mobility or, or things like that within all four of their limbs. Um, so they have their own division and it's actually a co-ed division. So you've got women um, who are competing against men, men who are competing against women and vice versa. Um, the one kind of thing I didn't mention in the sport chairs for the quad division is that, you know, a lot of them you'll see they've got um, straps around their midsection. This is because they may not have full core mobility. Um, so that's something that they've added on to their sport chair to make sure that they are able to stay upright and in their chair at all times. Um, a lot of them as well, you'll see that they actually tape the racket to their hands. Um, this is obviously because they are not able to grip it correct, uh, properly um, or for long periods of time, for instance, for an entire tennis match. Um, so they'll actually um, like use hockey tape or tennis tape or whatever kind of masking tape um, to sort of keep it in their hand. Um, this obviously makes it very difficult to change your grip when you're playing tennis. Um, so they just tend to have one grip and then that's it. Um, but yeah, so those are the sort of different divisions that you'll see within wheelchair tennis. Um, I play in the open women's division um, where you'll see, you know, all kinds of different disabilities. Um, you know, I myself have spina bifida. There are women with CP, women with MS, women with um, just amputations or, um, spinal cord injuries, that kind of thing. Um, same in the men's division, you'll, a whole breadth of different, um, you know, uh, disabilities or, or things like that. Um, and then the quad division. So that's it. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Claire, or, or uh, Candice. I keep doing that. Okay, we're gonna head over to, oh, hold on. Uh, rugby. Um, okay, Jess Lewis, I know uh, we've pretty much just presented classifications here. Do you want to talk a little bit about about this? Uh, sure. Again, I don't really know too much about rugby, um, so I just kind of threw this in here, um, but I do know that they are on a point system, um, and I think I'm not 100% sure what the point is that you can have on the team or on the field at all times, but you have to, it has to match up um, to a certain point, pointage um, for the team. Um, but there's more information there um, on the site as well. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and same for canoe and kayaking, right? These are really intended for you to just have a look 
to know that there are different classifications and um, you know, you can reach out to Brianna, you've got her, her handle from earlier, or there's, there's plenty of resources online. Yeah, and I know that um, Brianna is in the uh, KL1 for kayak and the VL2 for um, canoe. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks. Um, okay, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, and we're going to hand the floor over to Jess Silver and Paul Gabay, and they're going to talk about fitness equipment for every body. Um, so this will be of interest to everybody, I'm sure, too. Uh, I know you're, I, I just before we jump into it, um, or maybe while we're in it, um, Jess, we can talk a little bit uh, to Candace about, I see behind her, she has a skier there. Do you just want to quickly touch on that before I hand the, um, the mic over to Paul and Jess? Claire, what your fitness equipment at home? Sure. I don't know how, but I've made an entire equipment room in my bedroom over the pandemic. But one of the uh, most important, I say, would say for uh, not just sledge hockey, but um, for multiple sports, uh, I know a lot of track athletes use them as, as well, um, is but the skier alone perfectly mimics the uh, the stride that we take on uh, in our sleds. So when we're sitting in our sleds and with our sticks, we're taking a big long stride this way and using our whole core and leaning forward. So I, I'll demonstrate, but it gives I'm so the jealous exact, there. <laughs> it gives the exact same form of going all the way through. And there's, there's different ways that you can adjust uh, the machine itself. There's, there's clips where you can get the handles, uh, where the handles can sit and be at a starting position lower. So someone in a wheelchair can roll up and, and, and start using it. Um, also, the, I got the floorboard because I, I, I can stand on it, but uh, this floor piece doesn't have to come with it. You can actually mount it to your wall so you can actually wheel up to it and have it have it accessible. Um, it's it's run just like a treadmill or a row machine as uh, you can adjust the, the resistance level and uh, you can like watch your distance, speed, uh, distance over a certain amount um anything the same kind of metrics that you would find on on a treadmill or or a rower amazing that's awesome thanks for sharing that's a perfect segue into uh paul and jess silver i will hand it over to you jess you just let me know when to forward the slides okay yeah thank you i'm very excited to be here with my friend and colleague paul gubay who's going to be from resolution fitness and we're both going to be talking about adaptive fitness equipment i actually had the absolute pleasure of meeting Paul during the pandemic um, because we worked on a project with Ryerson, which I'll get into a little bit more when we start the presentation. And now we're doing a lot of work um, in terms of getting adaptive exercise equipment into facilities um, and really talking about the importance and universality of adaptive fitness equipment. I really wanna hammer that point home. So I will be talking a bit more about that as Paul gets into the slides. So without further ado, Paul, I will throw it over to you and let's do this together. Thank you, Jess, I appreciate the intro. Um, I wanna go through these slides uh, fairly quickly so there could be some opportunities for questions at the end, but I just wanna throw, throw in at the beginning, uh, a big, uh, something that's very important to me was to bring products to the mainstream that a lot of people didn't know exist. Um, uh, referring to even the ski trainer by, uh, that Claire had just shown. Um, in recent years, people have seen that a lot more regularly um, due to the popularity of CrossFit, but that machine is almost 15 years old. And I remember um, incorporating about two of them into a studio I operated back in, um, in Calgary, um, closer to 2010. And um, it, it's a product that, Anyone can use, and as Claire mentioned, with an attachment, it's it's a perfect machine for a person to, to roll up to in a wheelchair and works a ton of muscles. 
It's a machine that should be in every gym, um, but isn't. And that will be the same, something I'd probably save for a lot of the equipment that um, I'm going to talk about as we move forward. Uh, Tina, feel free to move the slide on. Uh, this particular product is called the Invictus Active Trainer. Um, it's similar to the trainer that Jess uh, Lewis talked about that her, her um, sport wheelchair is on. However, this is designed more for day chair. Uh, I actually stumbled onto this while I was doing research for Ryerson and trying to find the more adaptive fitness equipment options. This product was designed by a wheelchair athlete in the UK, uh, particularly in Scotland. I'm connected at the beginning of the pandemic and I just love this product and have been really focusing on bringing this product to uh, the mainstream. Um, I actually work with a personal a spin studio in Etobicoke that we've actually brought one of these in and we're going to try to make a spin classes a little bit more inclusive by offering the Invictus trainer as part of the class. And as I instruct my classes, I will be talking to the people who are on the bike, but I'll also be giving um, instructions um, related to forward movement, reverse movement, single arm movement, and pace in order to include people into the class while still having that energy of music pumping through the class. And uh, like we talked about in some of the other um, pieces of equipment, allowing friends to train with friends, family to train with family, and not have this separation that someone can go to a spin class, but family members who aren't participating that same way would be able to participate as well. So this is a great product. Um, I hope people ask me a lot of questions about this later. Yes. I yeah, if I can just chime in for a second. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, through doing the consulting with Ryerson and we actually managed to make the rack, the recreational facility, fully adaptive and accessible, which I am so proud to be able to say that my organization, registered nonprofit organization, Flex for Access did that in partnership with Paul. But the anecdote that I wanted to add was when I came into Ryerson and I went upstairs to the gym, Andrew, who he should have, I think he's on this call um, or said he was going to be, um, the manager of the rack, his eyes opened up and his jaw dropped when he saw me in the gym and we started having this conversation about equipment and about adaptive personal training because it's not something that was heard of in the mainstream. And really, in partnership with Paul, we're trying to change that perceptive compass and through facilities of allowing more individuals to be integrated into the mainstream uh, fitness industry and really realizing that, as I'm sure Paul will will allude to throughout his presentation and my uh, our shared presentation is that there's no exercise that an individual with adaptive or varying mobility needs can't do. And there's so much of equipment that's out there now. So just wanted to throw that in there. That's awesome. And I, and I would also suggest if there are people who have questions as Paul is going, like, you know, put your hand up or put it in the chat and Paul, you can address it as we go too. Perfect. Okay. Okay, awesome. So let's move on to your uh, next one. Yes, this is a piece that might be one of the more commonly found pieces of fitness equipment in uh, a fitness studio that does try to, to cater to people with um, varying abilities or who are in a wheelchair. Um, an upper body ergometer basically is a machine that allows for upper body movement, almost often called a hand bike. Um, this particular machine allows people to transfer from a wheelchair into the machine um, to do the upper body movements, but this seat can also be removed so that a person in a wheelchair can actually roll into the, the, um, the docking station so that they can actually do these exercises. Everything to, from the display to any adjustment points are within reach of a person in a wheelchair and allows it to be um, used by people who aren't in a wheelchair who want the upper body training from a rehab perspective or who want to try a different form of cardiovascular training. Um, touched on the, the ski trainer that um, Claire has described behind her. This is not the exact same one, but it's another brand that I represent. And then in the larger picture shows the extension straps that make it usable for a person in a wheelchair so they can grip it from the lower starting position. Uh, this is a little more elaborate piece, um, this being the intelligent controlled um, assistive elliptical. There's also smaller machines called active passive trainers that 
will allow the user to either securely fasten in with their hands or, or lower limbs. And the machine will allow for a, a, a slow level of natural movement from the machine, allowing the body to mimic what would have been that natural position, whether you're suspended from a harness or in a seated position with your legs locked in. What this allows for is the body to continue to move in the path that it's supposed to or was originally intended to, while allowing the brain to kind of slowly reform that type of connection between the movement. It's also very important for um, for muscles that aren't being used um, due to a specific um, uh, impairment to still be moved in order to keep function. And uh, there's a lot of different benefits just from movement and rotation that you can help with things with digestion and blood flow in the body. Um, being in a chair for a long period of time uh, can have a significant impact on overall health, um, health benefits, hence why it's so important to encourage every way possible for people to engage in activity, regardless of their impairment or not. Awesome. Jess, you wanted to weigh in here? Yeah, just two things I wanted to add. One is that there is the option of having the um, hand cycle also not have a seat. So for I've seen hand cycles where individuals can just drive up to the hand cycle in their chair to use a crank cycle. And I actually wanted to get one of those um, from myself too, um, because I wanted to increase my upper body strength. So there is that option. And it is important to always consider the fact that you can get different equipment with variations of um, adaptation that, that one needs. Also, the other thing I wanted to add is this elliptical is very um, expensive, I presume, Paul. Um, I don't actually know what it what it goes for in terms of a price point. But what I did want to add is that Flex for Access right now is in the process of working with George Brown College with their engineering students to devise a develop a simpler option for like the locomat, which would allow individuals to be able to be upright and practice gay training. Um, so the hope is to have that move beyond a prototype and actually have it in gyms. So again, the idea that, you know, there are different ways that you can still achieve the same type of movement. And I would add on to Paul's point that the whole body needs to be moving as much as possible throughout the day. Um, so I'm very excited to be working on that with my organization with George Brown. And hopefully we'll be able to get it to other um, facilities eventually as well. Yeah, Jess is absolutely right there. There is a very large assortment of products that are um, adaptive. Um, and again, uh, well, this is a sample in this presentation, but these are products that people haven't seen in the mainstream. Um, it's a little di bit different in the United States uh, when you go to different trade shows because they have a larger population uh, and hence a larger population with people, with, with, including people with an impairment of some form. Um, so it, it does... Uh, it is relative, I guess. However, um, those products that have been available are just not getting exposure in Canada because the the primary fitness facilities aren't making that a, a, a big point to have, whether it be universities, schools, or colleges, um, with the exception of Ryerson, I can say off the top of my head, considering what they've invested in. Um, this is the active passive trainer. This is kind of what I describe as a comparable um, type of machine to the elliptical I showed where a, lip, a person in a wheelchair can roll in position, secure their feet into the, the low feet pedal straps while operating the upper body. And the active passive component is that when a user has some form of strength or ability, they can propel the machine at their own will. However, at any points of fatigue, they can rest and allow the machine to, to take their legs or upper body through the motions to keep that blood flow and keep that repetition going to engage the upper body or lower body. Um, what I'm really happy to talk about is the strength equipment because um, as I mentioned, there are some pieces of cardio equipment that people have seen in health clubs, but um, a piece like this machine, the Genesis uh, chest press has been around for over 10 years and should be a staple in most gyms. 
Um, if you look at it, it looks like a traditional gym, that a traditional machine that you'd find in a health club that would allow someone to work their upper body and lower body. But a, a simple tweak of the seat, lowering it into a seated position will allow a person for a, in a wheelchair to back up to the back pad and then be able to still reach onto those handles to work their exercises in chest and from the ground on the, the straps. Now, the, the biggest thing about this particular machine and, and others that are in the series is that a, it's universally designed. So a person who doesn't have a physical impairment like myself can go to this machine, sit down at the seat position, do a variety of exercises from that one position. I could drop the seat down and do a variety of those exercises from a standing position. And as mentioned, the person in a wheelchair can go in position and with the seat down, do a variety of exercises from the same position. Um, I've helped Ryerson invested in a piece of machinery like this. It'll be, we haven't been able to talk a lot about it since this was installed at the beginning of the pandemic, but I'm looking forward to having an opportunity to, to hear what the feedback is on the particular machine. We can go into the next. Um, this is another one part of the series. It's the lat pull down high row. Um, as I described with the other machine, a person who doesn't have a specific um, impairment has the ability to do exercises from a seated position, a standing position, and a person in the wheelchair can also um, take the seat out of position so that they can actually engage with those exercises. There are also different extension handles for people to grab onto if they are, if it is a little bit out of reach. But with every cable-based type of machine, there is a potential for an infinite number of exercises. Um, if most people walk up to a lat machine in a gym, they're usually used to a bar where they can grab on and then it just goes in one direction. But having the single cable handles allow for a variety of different movements from that cable and working with that travel. So different people with different abilities, different um, injuries to, um, to active aging can find exercises that will allow them to train a specific muscle group. And then one of my favorites is the abdominal bicep. Uh, basically, there is no seat um, with this particular machine, uh, but a person without a physical uh, impairment can step into this machine, take cold of handles that are just over the shoulders and do a crunching position with back support. They can also do different exercises for triceps by extending them over the head. And from the lower position, take on those handles to do assisted bicep curls with back padding. So um, first glance, you probably see that a person in a wheelchair can back up into that position. And even from a forward position, grab those handles for a variety of different exercises as well, from bicep curls to rotation to rows. So very versatile. And again, a machine that every gym should have. That's great. Um, Jess, I'm just going to, I'm going to hand it over to you and then we're going to motor through the next few slides. Yeah, I just have a question for Paul. This is actually a genuine question that I wanted, <laughs> I wanted clarification on. Um, if I wanted to use this machine to actually work my abs, could I from a chair? I wouldn't be able to get that crunching motion. From a manual chair, yes. So because what you would do, and unfortunately that image is a little bit dark because the straps are black, but the, the pads hang low. So what you would do is back into the machine, you would reach back to take those handles and oh. just get yourself, you'll just pull forward. The straps will just rest on your shoulders. Okay. And as you press away from the, the unit, you will be able to engage your core. That's what I thought. Okay, cool. Okay, that's good to know. Now, this next machine is um, also one of the more, um, I don't want to use the word popular, but it can be seen a lot more frequently than any of the machines I've, I've pointed out, even if you've never seen them before. Uh, most Good Life Health Clubs have at least one or two of these machines, not particularly for from an adaptive standpoint, but more from a sport performance standpoint. However, it is designed for uh, to be ADA compliant and wheelchair accessible with all of the adjustment points at the height of a person who would be able to adjust them. This machine can change a variety of positions. Um, I'd love to show a quick video, but it, we don't have time. But if you have questions about it, I'd love to, to talk to you more. But this machine, um, we also put it into the Ryerson University um, from an adaptive standpoint, but um, from golfers to people with injuries or, or specific um, limitations, the adjustability allows you to do a variety of different exercises to, to strengthen your body. Um, and with multiple repetitions um, can even be cardio based as well. 
Um, and then we go into some training accessories. I'll whip through these. This one's called the package, similar to a medicine ball. It has a water bladder so that it can be used for uh, practicing and training different type of movements wrote from rotation to lifting to pressing, um, even just to lifting from your chair. Um, simple concept, uh, loaded resistance. It's adjustable by adding or removing amounts of water, uh, but a great for facilities. Um, when it comes to visually impaired, things like bar markers are important. Um, there's also options for um, visually impaired uh, medicine balls that have more of a white um, look as well to these markers because some people who are visually impaired can make out certain shades and uh, white being one of them, um, even down to uh, skipping ropes that are, are made in a similar way. This, speaking of skipping ropes, adaptive multi ropes operate like a traditional skipping rope. The athlete would take the handles into their hands and then swing them around. Some of them are also weighted, but they're cut at the end. So it's basically two independent um, straps with a weighted with a weighted uh, cord that are looped around so it doesn't have to go over or under the athlete, but still works the shoulders. The arm, the Aldrich arm harness is designed for para-athletes, or excuse me, is designed for athletes who are amputees. And this will allow for different exercises like um, uh, I'm having a brain freeze right now, but a lot of different lifting exercises to help distribute the weight and allow competition or training of lower extremities as well. And something as simple as a lap pad. Um, people who don't have feeling in their legs uh, may require a lap pad so that if they're doing any sort of lifting or heavy weight and putting it on their body, they're not causing any unforeseen injury due to not having that feeling or sensation. So a lap pad just allows you to rest weight or rest bars on your lap while preparing for various repetitions and having a place to rest the weight so you're not injuring yourself while training. Uh, this being a monorope, another, another piece designed for um, amputee or people with limited ability with one arm. It is, a, it is joint and collapsible, but allows to get that cardio benefit of of skipping and that is all <laughs> that is a or lot now. or now there's lots more out there that's just a sample and i'd love to direct people to my website to see the the collection that i have of adaptive equipment and and i'm, I'm always trying to add to it well um that's great paul and jess i'm going to hold off on your question because we need to jump into the borrow programs and then we will circle back in the networking if um, we want to do any more follow-ups on it um, thanks for your time, both Paul and Jess. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge, um, you know, from an equipment standpoint, but also from a consulting uh, standpoint. Jess mentioned earlier that she's helping lots of organizations become more accessible. So uh, we'll make sure we put contacts in um, to the uh, text chat bar for everybody if they want to pick up people's uh, connections. Okay. Uh, I'm going to jump us into the equipment uh, rental and borrowing section. Uh, Jess Loris, maybe we'll just We'll plow through some of these things, okay? Yep. Just so we can stay on track time-wise. Uh, yeah, I'll just kind of name the um, organizations that I know specifically. Um, so Cruisers um, Sport, which is a um, club based out of Mississauga and Brampton. Um, so these are the different sports that are offered um, and there's their website to learn a little bit more. Um, I know they do have a wide array of equipment that can't be borrowed. Um, and I believe you just have to be a member in order to qualify for that. Um, as well as the on-parent network. Um, I know these are specifically the three that they um, provide for. Um, and they also have a bridging the gap program um, that um, it's kind of like a try it session. So it allows you to um, see what equipment there is and, and what sports are available. And their website is there as well. That's awesome. Um, I know we have uh, Kevin and Emily on the line. Do you guys want to talk to any of the um, the loan programs, borrow programs that you have available? We are currently establishing the program uh, at the moment. So I don't want to go into too much detail of it, but I know for a fact that currently in 2022, we can offer sport wheelchair basketball sport wheelchairs for wheelchair basketball <laughs> okay that's great so that's ferris sport ontario 
Uh, perfect. Okay. So this now brings us into our um, open discussion session. Um, we'd love to, um, you know, just have any broad questions people may have. Um, I know Jess Lewis has some kind of guided questions here, but I wanted to just maybe open up the, if you guys want to take yourselves off mute, if there's anything specifically you wanted to ask any of the, the athletes or the um, equipment experts, um, please now's the time to do it. Or if, you're, or if you're thinking about starting your own loan program or purchasing your own equipment, um, now's the time to do it. Anybody have any questions they want to throw on the table? Go ahead, Jess. <clears throat> I was just going to make a point off of uh, Paul's, like the end of Paul's in my presentation that I know he was sharing specific pieces of equipment um, and the goal is to get more of the pieces of equipment into facilities. I want to help Paul onboard more gyms and studios to make them accessible using the equipment. But the other point I wanted to make is that working with para-athletes or adaptive athletes um, and really any client, but specifically for special populations, it's really important to be to communicate, number one, and to com for the athlete to communicate their needs, but also for the trainer to allow um, for them to communicate any questions they have so you can develop effective programming, but also to be creative and but do it safely, obviously with the appropriate support and the, the different equipment and accessories that you need. Um, one of the points I was going to make was that I know we focused on equipment here, but also there's a lot that your body weight, uh, your own body can do. Our body is the strongest vessel that we have, I always say. Um, and I'm always surprised when I get on the floor and I do a plank and I can hold it for almost two minutes, um, how my body can do that. So one of the things to always incorporate too is body weight exercises with the support of different accessories and also incorporating that into the more complex type of exercises that you do with the specialized equipment. So I just wanted awesome. to add in there. Um, I would like to maybe, we have Angela on the line. She was one of our yoga instructors for one of our Paramazing um, groups. Are, is there any equipment you want to talk about with yoga that might help make things more um, accessible? Um, sure. I mean, yoga blocks are always great. Um, and um, I do a lot of uh, chair, I do chair yoga classes um, for office like corporate corporate clients um a yoga strap is always great to help give you that extra availability to maybe like reach the toes um, you can just wrap the strap around the end of your feet and um bolsters are also great um, you can buy like you know even if you just use a big cushion off of your couch or a big pillow or a yoga bolster um, there are so many different ways that you can make yoga adapted and um, really it's it's for everybody it really is and have um, you used the reformer at all with any clients no i haven't because yeah. i i use the reform i'm lucky i have a reformer at home i recognize that i'm lucky because no, you can't really, they're expensive it. and they're hard to get um but i know and i've worked with other yoga instructors that use the reformer also and it's a really great tool piece of equipment for individuals that can't get onto the floor to do yoga um because you can have it where it's more elevated and there's more support and then the straps also provide you with additional either support or resistance um so i wondered if you have experience using the reformer with any of your students i don't i've never used a reformer um i think it's used a lot with pilates am i yeah. right there pilates well yoga and pilates okay I haven't had any experience with it myself. How about you, Ashley? What kind of sports are you into or athletics are you into? Um, I'm trying to get into some more and dabble, but I like do more home training than anything. Amazing. So, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I want to try wheelchair rugby, but. Amazing. Not, do you have any, 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 um, any fitness equipment at home that you use? Um, I have the mute. Uh, it's new equipment, I think, out of the split ropes, so they're weighted. Then I have a skier, and then just basic weights. So. I'm envious. I want a skier. <laughs> that looks so cool. Looks very cool. Good way. Paul, can you gift us all with skiers? Everybody, 
<laughs> you have to like us a lot. I think they're not very, they're not very inexpensive. That's for sure. I would love you even more if you did that. Just say. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, we're really appreciative. To I, only, I, only, I got mine through a grant. They are they are pretty expensive. I, I luckily got mine through a grant. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. And, you know, there are um, some of the organizations we mentioned uh, on Para, I know, offers grant programs. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if uh, Para Sport Ontario does, um, but there are other organizations where you can apply for grants uh, for equipment. I know that Para Sport Ontario had an equipment drive in the summer where they had a big competition where if you you know you can um put somebody's name in for some equipment grant i mean we know how important equipment is for people who um who need it um to keep moving so i want to say thank you very much to our participants our athletes our equipment experts um and all the participants um we will make this video available for you all we will also make the presentation available for you um paul uh and jess um, and our athletes are all very um, accessible. And uh, if you have any interesting things you want to talk about, whether it's equipment purchases or rental or whatever it may look like, I suggest you reach out, um, reach out directly to them. Even if some of you um, have questions about adaptive programming, if you're looking at incorporating adaptive programming into your facilities, or you have questions around what that means, because um, I still get practitioners look at me sideways and, you know, kind of say, can you explain what that means? And I would say, well, I'd love to, you know, I, I spend large amounts of my day doing that. I'd be more than happy to have that conversation with you and to look at the programming that you already have in place and to help uh, make adaptive programming more mainstream, because I really believe that everybody needs to be moving. And the reality that I always say is that individuals that have varying mobility needs need to move more and are actually stronger than your average quote unquote able-bodied individual. So when we get overlooked and we're underserved, that's a problem because we actually need it more than everybody else. And in my opinion, and other athletes on this call will attest to it, we're actually stronger, I think, than, than the mainstream population. So I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for this awesome community. I will, um, if you haven't already, go to our see what she can do slash paramazing circle um, webpage and just join the group. It's free. And in there, we'll post um, Paul's contact. You'll get Jess's contact. You'll see um, handles, social media handles for some of the athletes that you can follow and cheer them on as they, uh, they move through their sports. So thanks everybody. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.